Okay, well, let's uh, get the show on the road. Uh, I want to welcome everybody today to today's uh, webinar that's brought to you by the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council and the University of Tennessee Residential and Community Forestry Working Group, which is made up of those three uh, other entities of uh, University of Tennessee. And this has been a partnership that's uh, been working together to bring you topics of interest. Uh, related to tree care and urban forestry. Uh, my name is Neil Letson. I'm president of the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council. And for those of you joining us for the first time, um, these webinars are brought to you free on a monthly basis, usually the third Thursday of each month. And uh, as I said, we try to bring topics of interest to you. So we're asking if there's something you would like us to cover to please let us know. You can send that suggestion in by via the chat room, but we'd love to hear from you. Uh, now, today's topic has to do with what I think is maybe one of the fundamental needs for a good quality tree care. And also if you're involved in your community's tree program, and that is tree identification. Uh, we have uh, as our speaker, Joellen Diamond, who's going to uh, give us an overview of that and she told me earlier this is kind of like a launching pad to uh, I, in, in my judgment a lifelong pursuit of being a better uh, tree identifier. Uh, before we do introduce her I do want to uh, make note that if you have questions during her presentation you can enter those in the chat room and we will set aside some time at the end of her presentation to have her give her answers to those questions. So please, if you have any questions or clarifications, use our chat room. And also I wanna remind folks, those of you that are certified arborists through the International Society of Boriculture, this has been qualified and approved for one CEU. So we need to make sure when you registered, you gave us your CEU number. And if not, just send it to that email address right there. That's Christy's email address. I'll give you a second to jot that down if you need to. Send her your ISA certified arborist number and she'll make sure you don't have to do anything else at the end of the presentation. We will take care of submitting that information to the Southern chapter. So with no further ado, I'm gonna introduce Joellen Diamond as our speaker. She is the Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis. Uh, before that, she was a former extension agent with the University of Tennessee. I think it was in Tipton County. She can correct me if I'm wrong, but she has spent, in my judgment, a career in education and she's passionate about it and very knowledgeable. And she loves to share her knowledge and uh, experience regarding horticulture and arboriculture and urban forestry. And as a footnote, I'll add that Jo Ellen has been very active in the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council. She is a board member, which is where I got to know her a few years ago. And she's currently active in the West chapter of the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council. So uh, the uh, botanical gardens out there, if you wanna uh, learn more about uh, horticulture and uh, boriculture, that's a great place to go to and participate with that group, the West Chapter. So, uh, Joellen, are you ready? Yes. There you go. It's yours. Okay. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Uh, this is really is a, an introduction to tree identification. If anybody has a, a, an ID book of any kind, this is some of the places that it's gonna start with questions that you have to know the difference of first. And so I kind of took it from that point of view. Uh, and so we'll go through this and uh, we will uh, try to identify a tree. Okay. The first thing they're gonna, uh, to, to look at is, is leaf identification. Now this is the shape and the type of leaf. This is gonna help you identify a tree. The first thing they usually gonna ask you, is it a needle-like 
leaf. And a needle-like leaves are long and slender. They get their name because they look like sewing needles and they can be attached uh, to the stem by themselves or in clusters. So that's what it's, so if it asks, if it's got needle-like uh, leaves, it, this is the needle-like leaf. And then the other question, whoops, wait a minute. Ah, let's. Uh, sometimes it, besides the needle-like leaves, it'll ask you if it has scale-like leaves. And these are very small scales. They overlap each other like the scales of a fish. And some of the scales stand up on the stem and are prickly. Others are just lay flat one on top of the other and don't have any kind of reaction when you touch them to say, ouch. Uh, but these are called scale-like leaves. So needle-like leaves, scale-like leaves. Mm -hmm. Or is it a flat or broad leaf leaf? Now broad and flat leaves are thin and flat. Uh, they are wider and longer than they are thick. The largest, this has got the largest group of trees in it. And, you know, you can, we're gonna talk about after you get to this point, because when you go to, when you say, yes, it's needle-like or scale-like, It'll, it'll send you to a certain section, and then you can continue IDing. If it goes to a flat and broadleaf section, say, no, it's not needle-like or scale-like, it's, it's flat and broad or broadleaf, then it'll take you to this section. And now it'll further divide, and since the majority of what uh, uh, plants are in this category, we're going to go to, we're going to say that our uh, uh, leaf was with flat and broad. So we're gonna to go to that section. And the next thing that's gonna ask you is are the leaves attached opposite or alternate? And it, that's, it, you know, you, you'd think that it is an easy question to answer, but sometimes you've got to really look close because the leaves are attached to the stem very closely together and you have to look at it, make sure that it's not opposite and it's, uh, that it is alternate. Opposite meaning each leaf is attached to the stem right on the other side of the stem from each other. The buds and the uh, leaves are attached on the opposite side of each other along the stem. Alternate means that it, there's one attached on one side, then a fluid down is attached to, down another side, so they never are across from each other on the stem. So that's going to be the first thing it's going to ask you. And then, then you're gonna have to you know, go into other things, but which is what we're gonna look at now. And here's a clue um, for those, because sometimes you can identify a family of trees or where it belongs in a family. And this is how one of the re things that you can do with that. They call it MAD HORSE, and it's an acronym for Maple, Ash, Dogwood, and Horse Chestnut. Those are always, uh, have uh, opposite leaves, but uh, there are 16 more genuses that have opposite leaves. There's very few of them that we have around here. A lot of them are, are tropical. The Sterocytophyllum, the first one there is the Japanese Katsura tree, and we do have that around here. We also have uh, Chiononanthus down a little further down the list. That's the fringe trees. Um, we have Catalpa trees. And unfortunately have Pauania trees. Those are not a desirable tree in our area, but those, we do have some of those in the areas. Um, you can grow chip telopsis trees here, but there's very, they're very rare and usually only found in botanic gardens. But if you're out in the woods, you're most likely gonna come across a maple, an ash, a dogwood, or a horse chestnut to have opposite leaves. And so if you have trouble deciding and you know it's not one of those four, you most likely have an alternate leaf pattern to go to that section. Then it might ask you, okay, is it simple or have, does it have compound leaves? Well, 
Simple leaves simply mean it just is a leaf. It's a single leaf. And compound means, think of your hand. Uh, you're gonna have a lot of little petioles, leaflets attached in one central location. And if you actually look at a compound leaf, whether it's uh, hand-shaped or if it's like a pecan or a hickory that has others attached along the petiole, you got to look at where the petiole attaches this, the stem. You got to look, say, now, is this the petiole or is this the, the stem? Um, so you've got to determine that to, 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 to determine whether it is a compound or a simple leaf. There are simple leaves. This is a breakdown of some of the areas that will be identified in an ID book that you're going to have to look at. The vein pattern. There's a lot of uh, trees that have distinct vein patterns that they'll talk about. They will talk about the blade of the leaf, starting with the apex or the top. Um, talks about the margins. Are they smooth? Are they serrated? There's all kinds of things that uh, and the base of it, the base, the bases of leaves have different shapes and there's all kinds of names for those. So that's what you're going to have to, to look at uh, to help identify the plant. And of course, the stipule and the auxiliary bud all play into identifying a tree. So those are some of the parts. And in a compound leaf, this is what I'm saying, you've got to sign if it's the petiole or if it's the stem. You've got to determine where the stem is to make sure that, the, that it is a petiole and not a stem that you're looking at. Uh, and you, one of the ways you can identify that is by the little auxiliary bud that's right there on the stem next to the petiole. So that's a good clue as to that is a petiole and not a stem. So that Leaf above it is actually a compound leaf. So we'll talk a little bit about leaf margins. And th there's a, a big uh, category that has smooth or serrated. Uh, and these are just the examples of those. A smooth leaf is exactly what it says it is, it's smooth. A serrated leaf means it's jagged or toothed. Sometimes they'll call it doubly serrated, which means there'll be serrations and then there's little serrations between the big serrations. So smooth and serrated are two very common uh, identifiers for trees that you'll come across in your book. Another leaf margin, uh, uh, description is, is it, does it have lobes and sinuses or is it entire? And the, the simple definition of that is that what you see right there, lobes and sinuses, uh, they go in and in the in and out, the, the one that's down is the sinuses, the, the ones on the top are the lobes. And of course, entire means exactly what it means. It, it's a completely entire, there are no, um, Sinuses or lobes, there's no other indentation, indentation to the leaf. It's just an entire leaf with a, with a margin. And of course, vein patterns. Uh, the pinnate or single major vein is a large part of the identifiers. Also, palmate, which means that they have several main veins in the leaf. Uh, those are also some identifiers that they will ask questions about. But uh, yeah, just understand that pinnate means a single major vein. There's some other uh, vein patterns that you will come across. Dichotomous is the ginkgo. It's the only tree that has that vein pattern at least that I'm aware of. That's what I've always been told. It's the only one. It's a ginkgo trees are ancient trees that go way, way back um, hundreds of years. And they are some of the most simple, simple vascular systems of trees. And so they have this special veining pattern that's called dichotomous. 
uh, dogwood trees, another one that has uh, a vein pattern that's very distinct to it. And it's called arcuate. There are several other trees that have this vein pattern too, but dogwood, especially in our, in our forests, this is a, a pattern that even if the shape of the leaf is a slightly different, if you come across a vein pattern that's similar to this, uh, you're gonna say, hmm, that's gonna be some type of dogwood because dogwoods all have this type of arcuate veining pattern on them. And as you can see, it's very distinct because it kind of, it's kind of like the, the veins are, it's a single main vein, but then have these other veins that look like main veins that come out from them. It's a very distinct pattern. And then it's gonna ask you about the textures of leaves. Um, is it pubescent or hairy or is it smooth? And these are just examples, uh, two examples of that. It, here's a, a, a fuzzy, uh, hairy, pubescent uh, textured uh, leaf. And then here's another one that's very smooth and shiny. Some other identifiers, bark, buds, and branches. They're all gonna ask you some questions about the bark, buds, and branches. And, you know, sometimes, you don't always have those with you. And, and for that reason, we have determined that September in the fall, August, September, the best time of years to identify a tree because you have, you have the bark, you have buds at that time, you have leaves and you have the branches. The only thing you don't have um, is the flower and Flowers can be identifiers, but if I had the choice between a flower or a bud in the fall, I would pick a bud in the fall any day because they there are more identifying characteristics of buds than there are of flowers. So really the fall, if you want to go out in the woods in the fall, the fall is, take your book with you, the, that is the best time of year because you have more things that they describe in the book to identify a tree with you. Bark can be very distinctive. In fact, there are whole books for just identifying trees by bark. Um, and the one thing you have to understand, bark changes with the age of the tree. Uh, the, what has, what's pictured here is an old sassafras tree, and it doesn't look anything like uh, the young sassafras trees. But this is extremely old sassafras tree. In fact, the, I don't know if it's easy to tell on this or not, but it's kind of got a reddish brown tinge to it, which is not like anything else in the woods. It's very easy to identify by this bark, especially since it's so tall and the leaves are way far up, it's hard to, to see a leaf. So this is a good identifier. And of course it's always there. So, I mean, it, it, it depending on the age of it, it does change with age, but it does not change with seasons. Uh, it'll stay the same through all the seasons, except with age. Age is the only thing that changes the bark, outer bark of a tree. Now these two, if you look at the leaves, at first you think, oh, they're very much alike, it's the same tree. But then you look at the bark and the bark is a very distinguishing characteristic of both of these trees and to help you identify it. The Caprinus caroliniana, the hornbeam, has smooth, um, muscle-like, in fact, it's called muscle, muscle wood or muscle tree, ironwood, all those things, because the, the tree is very smooth barked, whereas the hop hornbeam, Ostrea virginiana, has uh, scale-like uh, uh, bark on it, like it's peeling off. But the leaves of both of these look fairly similar. Another clue can be where they are found. And the hop hornbeam tends to be found on hillsides, whereas the hornbeam, the Carpinus caroliniana, tends to take more of a wet soil, so it's found closer to the stream beds in the forest. Both of these make excellent uh, trees for homeowners also. 
Some other bark identifiers, river birch. You can probably spot that from quite a ways away. It's very exfoliating bark, got light and dark colors with it. It's very distinctive, as is the sycamore with its peeling bark. And then behind the sycamore is that bright white smooth uh, bark that's underneath. And in the sun and the winter time, these really shine in the woods. Also the shape of the tree, the tree trunk. Um, this is a good identifier besides the fact that it's in water, but I mean, cypress trees are found also not in the water, um, but they, they do have this distinct uh, shape to them. So you're gonna be able to identify that without even having to look at anything else. Is it, oh, well, that's a, that's a bald cypress. Buds. This is the backbone of uh, tree identifying. Um, the buds are very distinct for every tree and they're gone into in depth in most identifying books. Uh, they all have their own way of looking so that you've got to start learning some terms. And in fact, the more you look at them, the more you'll just see this di distinguishing characteristics of each one. And of course, fall and winter. This is a good identifier for winter if you don't have any leaves. Uh, is a great way to identify trees is through its buds. And having gone through tree ID in Illinois from, from the September clear through till uh, May, the majority of that time, the leaves did not have, there were no leaves on any of the trees and we had to solely identify everything by buds. And so you, once you start seeing them and you study them, you can identify trees by just having the buds. Uh, <clears throat> this one, of course, is a very easy to identify tree. It is the, the beech tree, the Fagus grandiflora. Uh, you gotta watch yourself in the woods because there's a lot of these in our woods. Uh, because if you're walking through in the winter and you're hiking, People have been known to have their eyes stabbed by these uh, buds, they're so sharp. So you've got to be careful walking in the woods when you're around these. They can be dangerous. Other buds that are easy to identify are the magnolias. They always have large at the very, it's not all along the stem, it's just at the very end, there's gonna be this very fuzzy, big, large bud that's gonna open up into a flower in the, in the spring. So it's a very easy way to identify that particular family of trees is by the bud. Uh, dogwood is another one that's very distinct. You see, it's got a big swollen bud where the flowers are gonna come out at the end and, and it's really easy to identify also. Some other buds that are very easy to identify are the Jugland family, uh, the hickories, the pecans, the, the bitter nuts and the walnuts. They all have these big, huge uh, buds on the end. They're very chunky and most of them are covered in some kind of pubescence or hairiness. Uh, then there is of course the Liriodendrum tulipifer, a state tree, very easy to identify. I call it the duckbill tree. That the type of bud that's on the end of it reminds me of a duckbill, and it's very distinctive. No other tree has this, so that makes it easier to identify. And then branching, uh, branched patterns of trees can help in their identification. Now, now the branches sometimes they have distinguishing marks. Uh, like they're, they're rough to the touch, like river birch and red bud. If you run your fingers along the, the stems, you'll notice how rough they are. That's one of the things you can identify. Of course, we all know, we, even though this has no leaves on it or flowers or anything, we probably know that this tree is a crepe myrtle just because of the shape of it and the branches. Here, this red bud, not only is it rough to the touch, but you notice it has a zigzag pattern. In fact, you can see that very distinctly when you're out in the, the woods and you come across a tree with 
these branches that are dark brown and they have a zigzag pattern and they're rough. You can, without a leaf or anything on it, you can say, oh, well, this is going to be a red bud. Same with the dogwood. Not only do they have distinct buds on them, but look at the horizontal branching. Uh, very distinct for dogwoods. They have those horizontal branches and the buds are kind of growing up uh, for, you know, looking at the light and everything. So it's very distinct for dogwoods. It's horizontal branching. <clears throat> Sometimes silhouettes of entire trees can help in their identification. Now, being in extension for a while, I drove up and down I-40 and all around, all around the, the state. And, you know, it got, you know, to pass the time away, I'd say, hmm, I wonder if I can, you know, I started trying to identify trees going, you know, 70 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour down the interstate. And it got, was getting pretty good at it. But sometimes you can distinguish, um, by the branching pattern at a distance. And this is one of them. The upward facing top branches and the very, very perpendicular middle branches and then the lower branches that kind of go uh, point downward is a very distinct uh, branch pattern of the pin oak family. So Quercus palustris, this is a pin oak. And you, in fact, this is probably a, one of the easiest whole tree branching patterns to identify other than a bread for pear or a pear tree. Then of course, if you're lucky enough to get fruit and flowers, and that's why I like the fall, the fall is best for the fruit. There are all kinds of fruit patterns. Um, in fact, the, the books that have the identifying uh, sections that tell about the, the fruit descriptions. They're very long, uh, they, but you know, of course, pictures will help you out. Some of the common fruits that are easy, some of the common fruits that are easy to identify are acorns and samaras and legumes. Uh, droops, and berries are interchangeable. I think in fact, you, from looking at them from the outside, you cannot, unless you know that what that tree is, you can't tell if it's a droop or a berry unless you have more uh, identifiers for that tree. Because droops, you have to you have to get inside the the, the berry to see it. Um, the droops have only one seed surrounded by flesh, which is what's pictured. But berries uh, have more than one seed inside the flesh. So you're going to have to cut, that's an identifier. And, and if you're in question of whether it is one type of plant or another, one is supposed to be a droop and one is supposed to be a berry, then cut the, cut the flesh open and see how many seeds are inside. And that'll tell you if it's a droop or a berry and help and identify that tree. Here are the acorns, lots of acorns, very distinct to some uh, uh, oak trees especially uh, acorn, the sawtooth oak, very distinct uh, cap on that. Can't quite miss it. It's the only one that's really like that out in the woods. Uh, red oak, nice ornamental uh, tree that has good acorns on it. But one thing you can look at when you're looking at the acorn is the acorns are not going to be close to the ends of the stem. Acorns usually form on red oaks on the previous year's growth. So they're gonna be in further on the, uh, it's gonna be in further on the stem. So red oaks tend to have their acorns further down the stems of the tree. Whoops, let's go. See if I can go back. There we go. Samaras. There's all different types of Samaras. There's a lot of different plants that have Samaras. Some of them are the ash family and some of them are the maple family. And both have Samaras. They're, they're like wings 
And so when they fall off, they'll flutter to the ground. And uh, when birds and animals eat them, they just this they spread them around. But but their idea of these is they're both like winged samaras, and they they uh, ha have different shapes to them. The ash samaras tend to be more um, linear, and yet the and the maples tend to be lar have larger wings on them. But they all have very distinct patterns. Then there are legumes that are on the, the red buds. Uh, the, all the legume family trees, and there's lots of them, they will have bean shaped uh, a fruit on them. And you can pick those. And the seeds, most of the time, are viable. So you can plant them and do the right stratification and right timing of cold and hot and, and get them to, to germinate. Um, again, a droop. This, this is a, I think that's wrong. I think that's a holly. Well, I'll have to check that one out. I may have made a mistake there because I don't think that's the right one to go with that, right picture to go with that, that <laughs> saying there. But uh, you're going to have to to look at inside that flesh of that. If it's got one seed in it, it is a droop. If it's got many seeds, it, it is a berry. Well, and a nut with a husk is another type of fruit, and a lot of the juglans family has that, like the pecans and the hickories. They all have a husk around the nut inside. And so you can get into families with that by knowing that it's a nut with a husk around it. Um, then, of course, the berry. Uh, persimmons have berries because inside the flesh of these uh, a fruit are many seeds. So that makes it a berry. Then we can get into some flowers. Flowers can also be a good way to identify a tree. Um, they all, all trees do bloom, but sometimes their flowers are not showy. And, and knowing what a tree looks like in bloom can help with the recognition of it. Now, I, maples are one of the ones that I always look forward to in the spring if I had to drive somewhere. Uh, you'll see them off the highway. There's all different, you'll know that they're different kinds because the, the colors are slightly different. Uh, reds and oranges and just real pretty along the roadside. And they're one of the first to bloom in the spring. So that's why they're easy to see and identify. Some other interesting uh, fruiting plants are the Sawtooth oak, Quercus acutissima. Look at these long, long uh, fruit on this tree. It's gorgeous. And, and look, it almost looks like it's, in, in, it's leafed out. There's so much of it. it but it is absolutely beautiful uh, in, in flower, just like if, it, if those were uh, pink or red. Uh, it just, there's, it's just something pretty in the early spring when nothing else it didn't have leaves on it. So I think that some of the green fruits of some of the trees are just as pretty as the colors. And of course, we can't forget our dogwoods. This is a uh, Cornus Florida, uh, the Florida dogwood and Cornus moss, the Cornelian cherry dogwood. Uh, both bloom at a slightly different times. The Cornelian cherry dogwood will bloom before the flowering dogwood. And, and you can see there's a little bit of a, of a magnolia blooming with that Cornelian cherry dogwood also. So flowers are, they really help in identifying a tree. And in, even if you don't know that that first one is a sweet bay magnolia, you would know it belonged to the magnolia family based on the flower uh, because they all are very similar, just different sizes. And the sweet bay magnolia 
has the added bonus that they kind of smell like lemons. So they got a little bit of a lemony citrus flavor uh, smell to them. Uh, Magnolia Solangiana, the saucer magnolia, tulip, tulip magnolia, a lot of people call them, uh, blooms in the spring. This one is blooms at a time that is notoriously uh, when we get frost. And many years we'll have beautiful fall, uh, blooming foliage, I mean, blooming trees. And then all the next, next thing we know, we get a frost, killing frost, and they kind of turn brown and smushy. Uh, but that just is the way it goes. But uh, that's, that's the chance we take with, with these spring blooming uh, plants. The Kwanzaa cherry and multi uh, blooming, multi bloom cherry, very pretty uh, when, it, when it starts to bloom. Another cherry, the Okami cherry, is a nice blooming. Uh, in fact, Okami cherry is probably one of the first trees of the, of the blooming spring trees to bloom because I think it's usually in late February, uh, beginning of March is when it finishes up blooming. So it's one of the first ones to bloom in the spring, which is also easy to identify. Well, this is very sensitive. Uh, next, we have uh, the Eastern red bud. Again, these are purple, uh, usually violet colored uh, flowering trees. Easy to see in the, along the road. Uh, I, as you go further along I-40 to Knoxville from Memphis, you will notice these when they bloom along the road. It's gorgeous how many of them that are there growing wild, it's nice. Another one, this is the white uh, Callaway crab apple. When it blooms, the crab apples bloom a little bit later uh, than in the spring than uh, some of the other plants. So it's, it's a, again, you can have a succession of blooms around in your yard or in your neighborhood based on the different types of spring blooming plants. The Cayonanthus virginicus, the white fringe tree, also very pretty in bloom. Uh, and then the Asculus pavia, the red buckeye, it also blooms. It's a smaller tree also. Uh, these red blooms, when you see this tree blooming, it's, you know it's time to set out your hummingbird feeders if you do that, because they, the hummingbirds seem to appear about the same time that these trees start to bloom. Then sometimes you get fall foliage color that can help you identify a tree. Some of them will be red, like the, uh, the Nyssa sylvatica, the black tupelo. These you can see from the interstate also blooming in the woods. Uh, the red maple, Acer rubrum, lots of good red fall color. Now, we don't always get the greatest fall color, uh, but but uh, they do turn red enough to we can say that they're red. Some good yellow fall foliage colors that we can look for is the ginkgo trees. You can probably identify them from way far away just because of their bright uh, of red, uh, yellow foliage and the shape of the tree itself. It's not a dense tree, it's very loose. Um, I consider it a more modern looking tree just based on the less amount of uh, a branching that the, you can see each branch individually with the leaves along the, the stem. Acer compastre, the hedge maple, beautiful, beautiful yellow color of, of fall foliage, almost as good as the ginkgo. Uh, another good way to identify that particular maple. Then you've got some that have all colors in them, like reds and oranges, purples and, and, and yellow, all at the same time. And if you come across some trees like that, you'll notice that they are, like the sugar maple is one of them. Uh, another tree in the woods that you can see is the liquid amber, Starastafluid, the American sweet gum. From a distance, you can see these multicolored 
bright leaves on the trees and and know from a distance that what that particular tree is. Very distinct in their coloration. Now, the best way to identify trees is just go out and start identifying. The more trees that you look at, the more times you go and look at a tree, the better you will get at identifying them. And, I, and when we didn't, I didn't go too much into the needle-like trees, but it, I can tell you this, in the woods around in the Tennessee area, the, the majority of the time, the pine trees you come across are going to be loblolly pine. That is a common pine in Tennessee. There are others, but that is the most common uh, you can come across. But as you can see, there's all kinds of things that you can, can, uh, can use to it. You learn to identify a tree. All I can say is the, the more you practice, the more successful you will be with identifying trees. And I believe that is all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Thanks, Joella. Yes, we do have a few questions in the chat. Are there any tools or field books you recommend to help with tree ID? You, you know, there, everybody gets asked that. And, and what you need to do is go to some place where you can look at a bunch of different ones. Um, because what, the one you're going to like the most is the one you're going to use the most. Um, there is one that I know the West Tennessee chapter uses for their identifies East, the Eastern um uh, identifying trees of the, of the Eastern United States or Eastern, yeah, Eastern US or Southeast. And, you know, that, that's a good book, but so are a lot of others. I mean, the, Audubon has good, but Peters has a good book. There's all kinds of uh, to re identifying books. What I like is to look at the book. A lot of these books will have a, a tape measure or, you know, the, the cover will have a tape measure on it. So when it says, is the, is the uh, needle or is the leaf five inches or three inches, then you already have on the book, it has a tape measure on the side that you can just say, oh, well, yeah, it's two inches or it's three inches. So it fits the category that you're looking at. Uh, another thing I like to look for in an identifying book is, is there a section on terms? Because I don't have them all memorized. And I don't, I mean, there's not very many people who do have them all memorized. So when it says, does it have, you know, uh, a pubescent uh, bud, then you're gonna have to, you know, if you don't know what pubescent means and you can have a, a, a identifier in the book, a dic dictionary that says what that is. So you can refer to that, the, the, the descriptions. Uh, I look for that in a book. Um, Pictures, I don't care about pictures as much because pictures, you know, I, I like line drawings almost better than I like pictures. Pictures, a few pictures are fine, but, uh, but line drawings are sometimes better because they're, they don't take into the account um, a lot of the difference in climates that are around the, the country. Uh, line drawings is the shape of the leaf and it's the shape of the bud and it, that's what it is. So I tend to like drawings much better than pictures and see then there's some places, well, I like pictures better than drawings. So it, it is, that's why it's up to the individual. Whatever is easiest for you to use is the book that you should pick. But one thing I, but the two things I think I would like to have is a tape measure on the side of the book that where it's got the lines for you know how many inches are. And I like to have the descriptions of what they're talking about in the book, if not 100%, at least most of them. So that when I have a question of what something it means in a description of a bud or a scale or something like that, I can look it up. So those are the kinds of books that I like. Great, thank you. And would you say that arboretums are good places to learn more about trees? Definitely. That is the whole purpose of arboretums is to help you learn the different trees that, that work well in your area. Um, yes. And, and if you take any, this is another thing you can do since they're already labeled, you know what they are, you know, trying to identify them with a book will help you with your identification. 
Uh, so you can take an, uh, your identifying book with you. You know what the tree is, but you can try to go through the steps to find out if you understand how to use the book to be, to be able to identify a tree because you have the answer in front of you. And the more you look at something, the easier it's going to be to identify in the future. Great, thank you. Uh, if there are any other questions, you can drop those in the chat and we will switch screens here. And I just want to remind everyone um, one more time that if uh, you need CEU credit, please email me after, um, after this webinar. And Neil, want to wrap us up? Uh, yes, I will, Christy, thank you. And and Joellen, thank you for a wonderful overview of, of tree identification and uh, really how to get started on the right foot. Um, I, you know, I was uh, thinking of your, just one point, uh, you said practice, practice, practice. I can't, I would emphasize that too. Uh, if we really wanna be good at this, you have to practice. Uh, and, you know, you can start with your home landscape or, or wherever, but just uh, get out there and look at them and feel them and touch them. And, and after a period of time, it becomes kind of intuitive. And I saw that in how you described uh, a lot of the trees that it's become intuitive to you. And so I thought that was great. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody for attending the webinar and uh, uh, once again, I just, I'm glad Chrissy's put up the slide there showing the folks who have their hands on putting these together, which includes you, Joe Allen, and helping put these together. And uh, once again, we really are looking uh, for some feedback from you on what we can do to improve these. We want to continue these on a monthly basis and uh, we want your input. And as a, uh, I guess a promo for next week or next month's uh, webinar, That'll be June 17th. We're gonna hear from Tom Simpson and he's gonna give us an overview of the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council's, let's see if I can get this right, the Legacy Historic and Heritage Tree Registry Program. And that's a fascinating uh, program that tries to identify and recognize trees that have some connections to our history and people's achievements. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that one next month. So thanks again, Joe Allen, and for all of you that attended and uh, you folks have a good week.